Hey everyone, it's Mr. Hefner. You knew that, didn't you? I thought you did. Anyway, uh, today, what we're gonna take a look at, we're still working in our unit on modernism, the modern era from 1900 to 1945. And we're gonna take a look at a short story by Willa Cather. Willa Cather um, had a sort of a reputation for writing stories about people um, making it on, on the plains, the, the, what was at the time the West, the Midwest, uh, with stories like O Pioneers. This one's a little bit different because it involves a character who has lived her whole life out on those plains of middle America, coming back East to Boston uh, for some needs that'll be you know, kind of like revealed in the story and things like that. And our, our narrator is a nephew who's meeting her and taking care of her uh, and kind of observing what she's like after all these years of, of living out there in the Midwest. So I guess there's nothing left to do, but get started. And here we are. The title of the short story we're going to take a look at today is called A Wagner Matinee, and it's by Willa Cather, as I mentioned. Uh, Wagner was uh, a German composer in the 19th century who composed uh, some operas that you would recognize. You would recognize the, the, the music if you heard some of it, even though you probably never listened uh, to opera in your life. They're a little over the top. Some of them involve the, uh, the Norse gods and the end of the world and things like that. And uh, a matinee would be an afternoon performance. So when it comes to opera, opera is one of those things where um, it's, if it's evening opera, formal wear is still encouraged, not just a, a jacket and a tie, but a tuxedo and a, a formal evening gown or something like that. A, a matinee was a, the same performance, but the crowd could be a, a little bit more relaxed. You could go uh, in more casual clothing. It was in the daytime. Tickets were a little bit cheaper. And what's going to happen uh, in this short story uh, by Willa Cather is that the nephew of the, the, the nephew is a, a first person narrator in our story. And uh, his aunt, who's lived out on the, on the prairie for many years, grew up well, ever since she got married anyway. She didn't grow up there, but from the time she got married until uh, becoming an, uh, an older woman, she's lived out on the prairie where, you know, it's, it's the frontier. You don't have some of the nice uh, entertainment type things that you have in the cities. So when she's forced to come back to Boston, uh, he decides to take her out uh, to see a matinee. And she used to be a music teacher before she left and went out there on the prairie. So we're gonna have a story that looks at uh, the, how perspectives change, point of view, if you wanna call it. Uh, but our essential question for this one is in fact going to be, how is the narrator's point of view changed in Willa Cather's short story? So we start out with a particular point of view and then our, our, our narrator is going to gain some additional insights as the story goes along. So we wanna look for those changes. Uh, there's a pretty good picture of, of Willa Cather, born in 1873, and uh, she did, in fact, spend much of her life out on the prairie in the frontiers uh, when she moved east. That's what she wrote about. So the, there's a little bit of regionalism in her stories, except she's in the 20th century, spending much of her stories looking back to a, an earlier time, the end of the 19th century. All right, so she was born in Virginia, but she was raised in Nebraska. And Nebraska, you know, even today is, is corn country. It's farm country. Uh, you don't see uh, you don't see mountains. You don't see high rises except in in the big cities. And, and back then, you didn't have them at all. Uh, she attended the University of Nebraska, which is a little unusual. I mean, not that she's educated, uh, but what's unusual is so many of the authors that we have. You know, they went to Harvard, they went to Yale, they went to Princeton, they went to Columbia, and uh, she went to the University of Nebraska. Nothing wrong with that. She uh, cut her teeth just like, uh, just like Hemingway did, writing for a newspaper. And there's something about that newspaper writing style. You've gotta be quick, you've gotta be direct, you've gotta be very clear. You can't have ambiguous writing that could be misinterpreted. She also was a high school English teacher. Yeah, poor, poor, uh, poor Willa Cather. But high school English teacher and a Latin teacher. And so uh, we, we did believe for a long time that much of what we, we know about English, we derived from our understanding of Latin. It wasn't actually accurate. We're starting to learn that now. Some of the rules we have in English were based on Latin rules and English didn't actually follow them. But Latin, some of you guys may be taking Latin, Latin is a language that follows a, a certain unrelenting precision. This is the way you do it kind of thing. 
uh, unlike English. And so uh, perhaps she learned a little bit more about language by teaching two of them. She was once, at one point, she was the managing editor of McCores Magazine. So McCores was one of these literary magazines of the day. And she's not just a contributor, but she is the managing editor and a female in the early 20th century. So that's quite an accomplishment. And as I said, a lot of her stories, she's known for these stories on the prairie, stories of pioneers uh, moving west, trying to make it on their own, that sense of determination. Uh, and and uh, what she does differently is, is she puts some strong female characters into these stories. You know, before her, you know, you might have had the old westerns and things like that, and it was it was always strong cowboys and gunfighters and gamblers. And she's going to put these uh, female characters in important roles. She won the Pulitzer Prize in 1922. I am not familiar with one of ours, but that's what she won it for. Uh, and again, the Pulitzer Prize, national prize. Uh, there's one given for a novel each year, and she was the one author that year in 1922 uh, who was given that award. And you might recognize the name O Pioneers, <clears throat> excuse me, um, and My Antonia, which uh, I don't know if we still do it, but it used to be part of the uh, 10th grade reading. Those two books are actually part of a trilogy that starts with O Pioneers and ends with uh, My Antonia. If we were in class, we would, well, there she comes. Uh, if we were in class, we would probably talk about this a little bit. And the question is, what emotions do you feel when listening to your favorite piece of music? And there's no question that music is a, a very, very emotional thing. Sometimes when we're feeling down, we pick the perfect music to go with feeling down. Sometimes we do the opposite. Sometimes, every once in a while when we're feeling down, we may pick something that's going to cheer us up. Right? But you can hear a piece of music that you've never heard before and immediately know if that's happy music or sad music. It's nothing but tones and rhythm. And yet we feel the emotion in those tones and, and, and rhythm and things. And so in this story, uh, when our narrator takes his aunt to go see that Wagner matinee, uh, I want you to pay attention and, and look for the emotions it, it brings up in her. And, and I, I put that image on, on the right there. Uh, that is the kind of costume you might see in a Wagner opera. It's the stereotypical one. And uh, I, I just thought she looked kind of funny dressed up like that. So I put her in there. Now there's a photograph of, of Richard Wagner. You don't really need to know that much about Wagner, but I just wanted you to understand why this is called a Wagner matinee. I've heard people call it a Wagner matinee because they don't realize it's Richard Wagner and he was German and it wasn't pronounced Wagner, it was pronounced Wagner. Um, but he's, a, he's purely 19th century. So he was gone by the time this story was written, but his music is still around today. And if you've ever heard the, the old, it's kind of a sports expression, but there's sometimes people say it ain't over till the fat lady sings. The original expression was the opera ain't over till the fat lady sings. And it was because in these Wagner operas, uh, there was often an aria close to the end of the story, uh, especially in these ones about the, the Norse gods and things like that, uh, where she would come out and sing. And that was sort of like your, your idea that, oh, it's wrapping up now kind of thing. So. Uh, all, all you know, common sayings like that have uh, an origin in something. And I just want to point out, I, I stole this image uh, from a website. Uh, at the time when I was putting this together, the Metropolitan Opera in New York City uh, was actually getting ready to do uh, a series. It's, it's, it's three, I believe, operas together uh, called Der Ring des Nibelungen, or The Ring of the Nibelungen. And the Nibelungen would be these, these Norse gods uh, as they're approaching the end of the world kind of thing. And uh, it's, it's a series of them. You would recognize the music like uh, Ride of the Valkyrie or something like that. If you just, if you just simply you know, go online and you put in that title, uh, you'll get some music coming up. And I, I promise you, you'll, you'll recognize the music right away. But we still go see these same shows today. Now, I explained what a, uh, a matinee is here. And what we want to do is we want to look at the perspective, the, the, the point of view as we talk through this one. Willa Cather was a music teacher. She loved music. And what would it be like to grow up in a world where you love music, but there is no music? Many of you guys walk around school uh, or, or public or whatever, and you have your, your, uh, your headphones on or your ear pods, air pods, ear pods, whatever they're in, and you're listening to music all the time. 
You know, uh, some schools who, who tried to ban those things, they've come up with policies that you can have one in all, all day long. And so uh, you can actually live your life to your own musical soundtrack if you want. If you, if you grew up kind of like being able to appreciate a full symphony orchestra with professional musicians in a time when, you know, there isn't radio and there are not iPods and, and, uh, and phones and things that will play music for you. The only thing you have is live music and you move to the prairie, uh, you might now find that you have nothing but your own voice or singing or humming, or maybe a couple folk instruments like a, a guitar or a fiddle or something like that. So what would it be like when you really love music to live your life away from the kind of music that you love? And we're gonna kind of explore that in this story. The literary tools that we're going to look for in here are going to be simile, and I know you know simile, so that is not a new one. Similes are comparisons that use like, or as. And so what you're trying to do in a, in a simile is take something uh, that you're trying to explain to uh, someone by using something that they already know. Um, now, a metaphor, we're not doing metaphor today, but a metaphor would be just like a simile, but without the like or as. And so it's a, it's a little bit more direct. So a simile is an indirect comparison, and a metaphor would be a direct comparison. And then we're looking at this idea of, of point of view. I know you know what a narrator is. You've known what a narrator is probably since first grade. But a lot of times we think a point of view is just like, you know, first person, second person, or third person. But you can have a first person point of view and have that point of view change as things in the story influence uh, the character that is sharing that point of view. And that's what we really want to look for here. We want to look for how does the point of view change uh, as we go through the events in, in this short story. So as you read the selection, uh, look for exactly that. Look for the changes in the narrator's point of view. See if you can find some similes as you're going along. Uh, and then, because it is Willa Cather and she did some amazing things in her time uh, on the prairie, writing the stories, managing a, a, a magazine and things like that, look for the role of women in the story. What, what are women expected uh, to do in that time? And, and do you see any divergent from, divergence from that? All right. Now, if you didn't already do so, go read the story. Uh, once you read the story, come back here and continue this video. I can't stop you, so if you're going to just listen for the answers now, you can do that. But uh, true or false, the narrator prepares for his aunt's visit for weeks. And that's false. He got a message which was delayed and he finds out that she's already arriving tomorrow. So he had like zero time to prepare for her arrival. His aunt's name is Georgiana. Uh, it says Aunt Georgiana was very influential in the narrator's life and absolutely, when he was young, uh, she, was, she was as important to him as a, a parent might be. And so the things he learned about her when he was young uh, and then he, he, didn't, he went all those years without seeing her and now he, he sees her that she's now that she's old, okay? So I, I guess if you're with somebody as they grow, you don't notice the change, but if, if you know somebody young and, and then you don't see them for decades and then they come back, uh, your, your perspective changes pretty radically. Number three, Aunt Georgiana suffered from motion sickness from the journey to Boston. You kind of have to read between the lines, but yeah, that's exactly what happened. So as she was traveling in those, you got to remember people didn't zip around in cars all the time. So anytime you got on some kind of, uh, you know, fast conveyance like a train, uh, it must have been kind of a shock to the system of some people who had been living out on the prairie. And number four, Aunt Georgiana and her husband planned to stay in Boston when they first married. That is false. Uh, they, they eloped. I don't know if you picked up on that word as you were reading the story, but to elope means that they didn't get the approval of their family members. Uh, they didn't uh, make a big deal out about having a wedding, inviting people and things like that. They simply slipped off and got married. And in those days, you suffered quite a bit of uh, social criticism from everybody. That just wasn't what you did. And so they dealt with the social criticism by taking off, getting out of Boston, going out on the prairie and, and living their lives out there. Now, our narrator's name was Clark. I called him the narrator so far, but you've read the story, so you know that his name is Clark. I think we only get it when Aunt Georgiana addresses him. I don't think he tells us, if I remember right, he doesn't tell us his name at any point. But number five says, Clark plans to entertain his aunt by taking her to a performance of, of Wagner's. And that's absolutely true. It's a, an afternoon performance of Wagner's music. 
I don't think it, it's a whole opera. I think it's just select pieces. All right, a couple more here. Uh, we're gonna do some uh, matching. Who, which character married Georgiana? So you've got Clark and Georgiana. She wouldn't marry herself. She wouldn't marry her nephew. It could be Howard Carpenter. It could be a, a tramp cowpuncher, or it could be Maggie. And of course, in this case, uh, it was Howard Carpenter was her husband. Uh, number two, who sang prize song in Red Willow County? And that's going to be this tramp cowpuncher. Um, evidently, he sang it really well because it burned an image in Aunt Georgie's, Georgiana's mind. And every time I read the story, I think, is there the suggestion that she was interested, you know, in this, this cowboy? like she might be interested in her husband? Was, was she attracted to him because of the song that he sang? Or was it just the beauty of the song that kind of stayed with her? Only one of these regularly lives in Boston and, and that's going to be Clark. So he's still there when Aunt Georgiana comes back East. And this is not important at all, but Maggie was a cow. All right, Maggie gets mentioned in here and I guess they wanted one more name for you. And before she married, Aunt Georgiana used to teach music at the Boston Conservatory. So she was quite good evidently to have a job like that. And then she gave up her, her contact with such highbrow music. Some fill-ins here, these are gonna be the literary terms. Uh, a blank is one who tells a story and that would be our narrator. And then number two, this is the vantage point from which a story is told. That's point of view. We usually see it as first person or third person uh, stories generally are not second person. Uh, I, I don't know if they're still around, but back in the 1980s, uh, we went through a period of time where these things called uh, choose your own mysteries were popular and you, the reader, were the main character. So they would literally write them in the second, uh, second person. You walk into a room, you look at the table, on the table are these three objects, what do you do? And then you would like say, I pick up the middle object, then you turn to page 96 or something like that. They were kind of fun, but they were not good stories. And number three, a blank is a comparison using like or as, and that's going to be a simile. If you take out the like or as, it suddenly becomes a metaphor. All right, this was a different kind of story from some of the stories we've read so far. It had a different point of view to it uh, and uh, a different style to it as well. I hope you enjoyed it. And I'll be in class if you have any questions about it. Always be sure to check Schoology to see if there are any other assignments that go with today's lessons. And other than that, I'll see you soon.